Amen. Now, I, I want to jump right into this message. And because uh, this is very, very interesting. I want you to go to 1 Samuel chapter 17. Very familiar passage of Scripture. We're going to be reading to start off a few verses, verse 49 down to 51. 49 on down to 51. Now, if you want to give to, to, our, to, the, um, to, to help us to do what we're seeking to do, just give. Make sure you put down to the building fund. The building fund. Building fund. Make sure you put down to the building fund. Um, I was talking to my pastor yesterday. Uh, my pastor pastors a church in San Jose. His name is David Canastracy, and uh, I love him. God has used him. I've been with him since 1998. He has been my pastor, and, and he is the one that sent us out to plant this church. Um, we honor him, and we thank God for him and their ministry, and um, I talk to him about things, you know, obviously all the time, about stuff that's going on. Let me say this to y'all. Everybody needs a pastor, and every pastor needs a pastor, and so I was talking to him, and I was telling him about what we're getting ready to do about buying this building and really going after it. And making a push over the course of the next two years. And he, and he said, he said, you know what? He said, now I know why God was speaking to me. He said, now I know. He said, I, I woke up the other morning and the Lord told me, take the shot. Take the shot. And he said, when I, when I heard that, I thought he was, taking, he was talking to me and talking about me. He said, but now I understand he wasn't talking to me. He was talking to me about you. He was talking to me about you. He said, how will you ever know what God will do if you never take the shot? He said, Pastor, this is God. Take the shot. He said, how will you ever know that God will do what he's going to do unless you step out and take the shot? He said, that was for you. It wasn't for me. And so this morning, the title of my message is Take the Shot. <laughs> king David, David here, before he becomes king, has been trained in the backside of the desert. God has raised him up. And in a secret place has got him to a position where now he wants to expose him and to release him publicly after he had already spent time being developed and trained by God. Oftentimes when God is training you, it's not in a religious setting. Sometimes he's training you, and it's, it's those things that he's doing in your day-to-day -day life behind the scenes that are preparing you for something that God has in the store for you. And David was this way. But in this moment, we see that, that the Philistines and, and, the, and the Israelites were in battle array, and they are, they, are, they are fighting amongst each other, and they are going through, uh, they're having a war. And there is a prize champion by the name of Goliath that is intimidating, intimidating Israel and constantly putting them on edge and they're fearful and nobody in the camp is willing to step forward and challenge the Philistines uh, prize champion. David, as he's going forth to, to shepherd the flock and to do an assignment or from his father, he, he comes to this moment and he ends up, he ends up, um, challenging this prized champion. And when we look here, we're going to see something, and then we're going to go back to the beginning. Look at verse 49. Then David put his hand in his bag. He took out a stone, and he slung it and struck the Philistine in the forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face to the earth. 
So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in his hand. Therefore, David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword, drew it out of its sheath, and killed him. He killed him with his own sword and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, the Bible says they fled. Look at your neighbor and tell him, take the shot. Come on, look at somebody else. Tell him, take the shot. Now, the shots that we're going to take are not just for the church. We praise God for what the church, but the church is the people. And so understand when we're preaching this message, it's not just for our local church in terms of what we're doing and going to do. It's also for your personal life. There is time for you to take the shot in life. It's take the shot. Now, there's, there's a few things here. There's five things that we're going to see in this story that are going to help us so that when we arrive to this point, when we take the shot, these other four points have processed us and prepared us so that when we take the shot, we hit our mark. Can I have an amen? How many want to hit the mark in your life? Verse 28 and verse 29. Let's go back. It says, now Eliab, David's um, oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And he said, why did you come down here? And with whom have you left? those few sheep in the wilderness. He says, I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, what have I done now? Is there not a what? Cause. This is point number one. Understand that David comes to this situation. He just comes down. He sees what's going on. And then he tells the people, I'll take him on. In so many words, he's telling, he tells them that I, I want to battle him. I want to battle him. But in the midst of him sharing this with the people, his brother comes and says what we just read. So point number one is always this, when you get ready to take a shot in your life, you have to be willing to dismiss your doubters. Write that down. Some of you, God has told you to start a, bat a business. Some of, God, some of you, God has told you to do this, or he told you to do this, or he's told you to go back to school to prepare yourself because he's going to do this. And it's amazing when you have something and you're inspired by God, you have something in your heart that you know is that you know, and you've confirmed, and you know that it's God. It's amazing how the devil will always send doubters. He will send people to discourage you and to try to talk you out of what you know is the will of God. Now, you have to know that is the will of God. And David knew what God was laying on his heart. He understood this moment and the cause. And so for all of us, as we do our due diligence and we come to the place where we know that it's something God wants us to do, you have to watch it because the enemy will always try to sow seeds of doubt. Because the same way... That, that God is listening to you, the devil is listening to you also. And he says, this person has potential. I got to try to stop them. I got to try to block them. I got to try to get them addicted to drugs. I got to try to get them messed up with the wrong people. I got to get them, I got to get them off court. I can't let them do what I know God is trying to do because it'll hinder them. It'll hinder my kingdom. It'll stop me. It'll push back darkness. And understand that this is one of the first things that you have to be willing to do is to dismiss the doubters. Now, in this particular situation, his own brother is doubting him. And it isn't amazing how that happens. How sometimes the closest, don't let me get started. <laughs> isn't it amazing how sometimes your doubters are the ones that are in your own home? Who you think you are. You're not going to be able to do that. You stupid. You dumb. You, you can't even think right. You can't get no degree. 
you're going to lose that job. You're going to lose that job. You can't, you can't do nothing. Well, you can't get off that. You can't stop drinking. Don't even try it. That's a part of our family. That's what we do. We wine bibbers. You know that. I was in my office one day, and Maria came in. I was studying that word. And she's like, what's a wine bibber? I said, it's King James. <laughs> it's amazing how people that even are close to you will try to throw shade on what you're trying to do. You and I have to be willing, when we know something is the will of God, we have to be willing to dismiss that. David in this moment didn't get into a big argument with him. The Bible says he just moved on and started talking to the other people and telling them that who is this guy? I want to take him out. I can do it. And it's important that we do that. Stop thinking that when God is telling you to do something that everybody's going to be in agreement. Oftentimes when God's telling you to do this, yes, you're always going to have a witness, but but stop expecting everybody to believe in your dream. You can't expect every, it's unfair for you to expect everyone to be, uh, to believe in your dream. There's going to be people that doubt. And God's confirmation for you when he meets you on the other side and blesses you, that's the thing that you have to continue to rest on. But I, and I say this all the time, and I, and I tweet this, and I talk about it. You know, stop trying to do things to impress your doubters. Do it for the people that believed in you. We, we give doubters too much space in our minds. We give haters too much time in our thinking. We have to be willing to step back and say, this is what God called me to do. And David, I love this in this moment, he doesn't get rattled because his brother didn't believe in him. Stop thinking everybody's got to believe in you. The people that need to believe in you will believe in you. And it's important that we realize that when, when we go forth. I had, a, I had a pastor years ago when, when, I, uh, when I retired from football. And I retired. And he, uh, he told me, he said, Napoleon, what are you doing? He used to have me come preach at his church. And God would move and the prophetic, we would be prophesying and moving. It was great. When I retired, he looked at me and he said, what are you doing? So you, 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 you shouldn't do that. That's, he says, that's stupid to do that. God has given you a platform. And I said, but no. I said, that's cool. I said, but football's not my platform. I said, God called me to do this. I'm going to step out. I'm going to step out and plant the church and retire. At this time, I was retiring. I'm going to retire and go into ministry. And so that was way back in 2000, right? About two years ago, that pastor was in the area, and he called me back. He called me up. He said, Napoleon, I'm in here. I want to know if I can come by and see you. I said, okay, come on through. So come on down to the church. So he came down to the church, and he came in, and he's walking around, and he's looking, at, and he's talking to our staff, and he's, and then we got into the foyer over there, and he says, he says, Napoleon, he said, aren't you glad you didn't listen to me? <laughs> <laughs> I said, yes. <laughs> so I'm, I'm saying, what I'm saying is this, you're going to have those. And I wasn't harboring any unforgiveness toward him, bitter. My expectation is, is not that everybody has to believe in me. Everybody has to believe in the dream. David doesn't get offended here. Often we get offended, but you cannot. David did not get offended. He just dismissed the doubt that came from, in this moment, even his own brother. He was willing to dismiss it. Never said he hated him. He just knew that no, nah. and he went on about his business. This is point number one. If you're going to get to a place where you can truly take the shot, you have to be willing to dismiss the doubt that the enemy is going to try to put in your mind or from the people that the enemy sees, sends to send those seeds of doubt your way. You have to be willing to do that. 
Point number two, let's look at verse 34 on down to 37. So he, he totally dismisses what his brother is saying, and he makes his move. And it says here, as he goes down, he eventually comes before King Saul, and he begins to talk to King Saul. Saul begins to believe in him, and he says this, and he believes in him because this. But David said, in verse 34, but David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from his mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and I struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. Mm. Some of y'all saying, I need a man like that. <laughs> Your servant has killed both lion and bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. Seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. He says, moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Amen. Point number two, and this is something, after we dismiss the doubters, we, we and write this down. We have to remove fear by remembering your points of reference. Okay? Write that down. Remove fear by remembering your point of reference. We have to have memorials in our minds. Okay? Now, what I mean by what I just stated is this. Along your life, there have been moments, just like with David, where God has given you victories. And for some people, they just think it was happenstance. But they did not realize that behind the scenes, God's invisible hand was the one that was leading you and guiding you and putting you in a safe place and getting you victory in your life. Oftentimes, we just think it's us. We just think, well, I was smart, or I just met the right person, I did. But you didn't know that it was God's hand nudging you this way and nudging you that way. And an angel saying, shut up. And an angel saying, go this way. And, and the Spirit of God moving you in directions. David was wise enough to understand that, yes, I beat a lion and I, be, I beat a bear, but it was God that gave me the power to do it. Can I have an amen, y'all? It was God that gave me the, part, the, the heart to do it. Now, in this moment, when he sees Goliath, he has a point of reference to release his faith and to, to dispel his fears. Anytime you step out with God or you try to do something personal in your life or if we try to do something as a church, there's always going to be fears that you have to overcome. Fears may be present. You just don't let them win. Fears may materialize, and you may have to deal with that emotion. But when you get ready to take the shot in life, in your personal life, you have to go back to that point of reference in your mind or that memorial in your mind when you say, man, but I remember when God did this for me. This seems like it's tough, but I remember... When God healed me when I got in that car accident, I remember when I started feeling my body quaking, and I didn't know if I was going to make it, but then God came through and set me free. I remember when the devil tried to tear up my marriage, but now we're still together 40 years later. I remember when they said they was going to fire me, but then God came in, and, and I remember when they did fire me, but then God opened another door. 
And be, can I have an amen? And something starts going on in your mind, and you start thinking about all your points of reference and moments where you can take your faith, and now your faith has something to lock on to. For David, it was the lion. For David, it was the bear. For David, he understood that if God did this for me then, then who is this guy? He can't stop the move. Can I have an amen, y'all? And we got to get to a place where we stop whining. We stop whining about our future and start saying, well, God carried me this far. He didn't carry me this far just to dump me off in the wilderness somewhere. God done brought me a mighty long way. And if God brought me this far, he's going to bring me in. Well, this is what happens in our lives. We got to get this point down because it's one thing to dispel the doubt that you have from people that are coming from without, but it's another thing to, and, and for us to deal with the doubt that comes up from within. Man, I'm afraid. I don't know if I should do that. I don't know. He's he telling me to take the shot. Pastor telling me to take the shot. I'm, I'm used to just helping some. I like to pass the ball. Can I have an amen, y'all? I like to pass. I'm like, you know, I'm like, I like to pass that thing. And he telling me to take the shot. I don't, I don't know about that. I'm not used to that. I'm not used to the pressure of the shot. I'm not used to the one that has to throw the rock. I'm, I'm not used to that, but I'll get you some rocks. <laughs> Can I have an amen, y'all? Can I have an amen, y'all? I'll get you some rocks, but I'm not used to shooting it. I'm not used to the one throwing it. I, I'm not used to that. That's not how, I'm not, my personality's not like that. I'm kind of shy, you know. And then people in their mind, they, they get stuck and they don't realize that God said, no, you take the shot. Go in there and knock on that door and tell them that you can do the job. Can I have an amen? You let them know you can do the job, and it's not you doing the job. I'm going to give you the power to do the job, but knock on the door. I can't do anything if you don't take a step. David here has a point of reference. Imagine a bear coming and taking a lamb, and David having to overcome his fears, overcome what's going on internally. He's not dealing with his brother He's not dealing with, but now he's dealing with himself. And he's saying, I got to take this step. I got to go get this lamb. I got to do it. I, gotta, I can't let this bear just, and then he gets out there, and then God meets him on the other side. Imagine trying to fight a lion. He said he grabbed him by the beard. Now, understand, I've, I've had the privilege of, of going to the, the Vallejo Zoo, and they allow us to go back behind they allowed me and some of the brothers on the team to go behind the, you know, the scenes and get real close to the lion and pet it. <laughs> I did. They took us back there, and we, Elder Kenyon will tell you, Kenyon was in, I got pictures of it, that they took us behind there and said, oh, you can pet him. He's not going to do anything, you know. I'm like, you're not going to do nothing. What you going to do? You can't stop him. <laughs> <laughs> they just had a chain, and this big old lion is sitting there. I'd never seen one before up close like that. And then he was like, come over and touch him, you know, and pet him. I was like, that thing was big. His head was so big. And I already got a small head, so I'm looking at his head saying, look at your head. And when I touched the thing, now just imagine this. When I touched the thing, I touched it, and it felt like this. His body was so strong, and it was like, I was like, this is crazy. <laughs> His paw was so big, and I could just remember. And so in my mind, I'm thinking, he grabbed it by the beard. <laughs> now, I'm not on that level yet. <laughs> I'm trying to get there, but he grabbed. That's why I'm preaching this. <laughs> He grabbed it by the beard, and he killed that lion. This is what he did, and I think it's important that we understand that there's, that becomes a point of reference. Some of you, 
Start going back in your mind and find those memorials where you know that was God. And release your faith. So when it comes time to take the shot, you are, you, your belief is built in and your feel, fears are dispelled because you know that if God did it there, that God will do it here. And this is what we have to learn to do in our lives. We, we, stop, we stop remembering what God already did and we're constantly wanting God to do something else. But what has God already done for you? That's your point of reference. Dispel the doubters and then remember what God has done and use that as a point of reference to take you to where God is trying to take you so that ultimately you take the shot. Can I have an amen? Amen. Look at verse 38. Verse 38 and verse 39. These are so important. It says here, so David... So Saul clothed David with his armor, and he put a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these. And then he says this, for I have not tested somebody say tested i have not tested them so david so david took them off he said i have not tested them write this down point number three use what you've tested i stand up here and i and i tell you guys all the time we our church our church is blessed our church doesn't we don't have any debt our church is not in debt at all some of these churches, $13 million in debt, $50 million in debt. We don't have any debt. We have our lease payment. We pay our lease every month. We don't have a problem paying our lease. We handle our business. And part of the thing is, is because built in within me, this is what God is. So when I look back, I say, this is how God has has is used me to do things. Now, it doesn't mean I'm not open to God using me other ways to raise money and stuff like that. I, under, I get it. But at the end of the day, you have to use what is tested. In your personal life, you have to use, there's ways, there's things that you have, that that God has put in your hands and have used to get you thus far or to bless you or to do certain things for the kingdom and just for your life. You have to use those things. And understand that David here when he says I have not tested them what he's saying is this Hebrew word actually means that he had not proven them this hasn't been proven or proved to me and so you can you can use that but that's not what I use you can use the sword you can use the helmet but they haven't been tested for me and and those things may work for you But it may not work for me. This is the reason why, even when it comes to church, I don't just get on the internet and copy what everybody else is doing. That that may work for you down the street. But this may not work for our church because that's not what God has proven with me. You know, and it's important that you realize that, that you become skillful with the tools that God has used in your life and tested in your life. And the problem that we have, and I just said this, but I want to say it again. Stop trying to copy what you see everybody else doing. Stop trying to copy what you see everybody else doing. Well, he sing like that. He hit that night. He, he. <laughs> You're not Mike. So stop saying he, he. Because <laughs> we all up in the church doing it. Can I have an amen? You're not proven. (laughs) That's not working for you. It may work for him, but it's not working for you. That's why I get up here. I, I I was raised up in the church, and my style is different than some of the people that I've been around my whole life. I'm not a hooper. I don't get up, and the Lord says, and God, and God, and God is moving up in here, and the Lord said, and I. Yeah, and God is, I, that's not my style. I'm not proving that. I might rip my suit. I might tear stuff up. I'm not trying to leave out of here with a sweaty suit in my face. 
That, now, that's somebody else's work. I love it. T.D. Jakes be preaching, man. I love it. But that's not me. That's not proven. Can I have an amen? You got to know. <laughs> you got to know what you, what, what you got. And who you are and what has been tested and tried. And so David, he's looking at Saul and he's saying, that works for you. But it's not going to work for me. I can't even walk. <laughs> and it's important that we realize that. When he says, I can't walk, he's saying, I can't go anywhere. I can't move. I can't advance I can't be as skillful. I can't be as agile if I'm, if, I, if I'm not proven in this. And for our lives, we have to see this, saints. There's things that God has given you that you are resourceful with and you're skillful with. Use that. Stop thinking you have to get something else. Start using what you have and master it. Master that. Master that in ministry. Master that in business. Master that in your marriage. Master that in your home. Master that raising kids. Do you see God breathe on that? Use it. Stop looking at YouTube. Stop thinking you have to be like this person or that person and this person on television and that person. Be the best you that you can be. Mm. And use the tools that God has given you. And then watch how God, if you step out and take the shot with the right tools, the ones that are proven, the ones that have been tested, you'll see what God will do in your life. And this is what he essentially did. He understood that this isn't going to work if I'm trying to be like you. <clears throat> it's going to work if I'm the best me. And as a result of that, he steps out. This is good. Verse 45 to 47, because this one, it gets to another level. Verse, this is the fourth point. And so we have to dispel the doubters. We have to always revisit those memorials in our mind and where God met us and release our faith and dispel our fear. We got to use what has been tested that David and had been proven. David was willing to do that. But look at this. Verse 45 to 47. It says, then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and a spear and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. He says, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcass of the uh, of the camp of the Philist give the carcass of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Point number four is this. Before you take the shot, you have to be willing to declare it and prophesy it. You have to be willing to declare and prophesy the success that God is getting ready to do in your life. And I think this is one of the main things that happens with people. A lot of times people are afraid to say it because if it doesn't work, they're going to feel they're going to look like fools or they're going to feel like they look like fools. I can't do it. I don't want to say it, but understand that you feast on the words of your mouth. Th the more you begin to get things out into the atmosphere and you begin to speak it, what happens, you give God something to work with because faith comes by hearing. And when you're starting to release that, what happens is it charges you and it encourages you and it puts you into a realm of faith. You have to be willing to declare and prophesy it. David tells this giant, this is what I'm getting ready to do to you. 
And this is what God is getting ready to do as a result of me stepping out and, and, do, and doing this. This is what's going to happen. And I think it's important that we get back to that in our lives in and, and, and faith. When we start to feast on our fears and doubts, we hinder what God's going to do. I don't think God's going to do it. Why is this always happening to me? See, I'm always, oh, man, I just can never make it, man. When am I going to get a leg up, man? When am I going to get a hand up? When am I going to get a hand out? When is somebody going to come down? When am I going to find some money on a tree? <laughs> Bobby Joe was just walking down the street, and they found some trash, and they opened up the trash, and there was $5 in there. How come I can not never find no money? Why is it that this is, and then we, and then we just doubters, and man, my marriage is never going to work, and my kids are crazy, they just crazy, they're not going to do nothing, they, oh man, and we start talking ourselves out of God's purpose, we start talking ourselves out of God's will, and David doesn't look at the giant and say, well, you are, you are huge, hey, you're going to kill me. I'm just a little Rudy guy here, and I'm just, and I'm small, and you're going to take me and smash me, and, and you know what, and everybody's going to laugh at me, and you know, it's, it, my life is over, but at least I tried. <laughs> no, he, he, he's locked in to the will of God. He's locked into the purpose of God, and then now his faith, now watch this, y'all. There's a place that you can get to in your life when you are walking with God. Well, all doubt and fear will be suspended from moments in your life. And you're just in a realm of faith. David entered into that realm. Peter entered. Silver and gold I do not have, but such as I have, I give unto you. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. All faith was suspended. I mean, all doubt was suspended. And the spirit of faith came upon him. And I think it's important that we realize in this moment, he's consumed with faith. And then he starts to talk about it. God's about to bless me with this new job. God's about to send blessing into my life. God's going to heal my body. God's going to save my family members. I've been praying for years. I can see the breakthrough. God's about to save my cousin and my uncle and my mom. God's about to do this. Ooh, I just feel this right now. And you just start telling yourself what you know is the will of God. This is what's going to happen. But I don't think it's going to be, well, I don't know what you think. And I'm not worried about you, what you think. This is what I know. This is what's going to happen. And David challenges not only the giant, but he's speaking to himself. And he's allowing God. Now imagine David saying this, and then God looking on high, like, man, okay. Yeah. Angel, did you just hear that? He said that, I, that I'm going to give him power to chop his head off. You think I should do it? Come on, y'all. You think I should do it? Yeah, do it, man. That'd be cool, man. Everybody think he's going to die, but you're going to give him the power to do it. All right, okay, okay, get down there right now and then um, give him some strength. And make sure when he throws a rock, it hits him right in the middle of his forehead right there. Can I have an amen, y'all? This is how God be working on your behalf, but you got to see it. You got to see that the invisible hand of God is there giving you the strength and the power that you need to accomplish the task in your life. But he needs something to work with. And this moment, David is telling the giant, this is what's going to happen. And this is what we need to start telling people. This is what God's going to do in my life. This is what God's getting ready to do in my house. This is what he's going to do in my marriage. This is what he's going to do in my finances. I'm getting my finances together. I'm not being broke no more. God's about to move. If I got to just shut things down, we about to do this. God's about to handle this business. I'm about to get this promotion because I know it's the will of God for me. God's about to do this. And there's something in you when you start talking to yourself and declaring it. Now watch this. And then also declaring to your adversary, devil, you can't stop me. <laughs> sometimes I, sometimes now, let me say this just so you all understand. You guys see all this stuff in the years. And you would be surprised. And, and, and I want to just say this. You would be shocked at the level of spiritual warfare that I experience because of all this. Trust me. Sometimes to me it's amazing 
what I hear the devil say to me. It's amazing. And, and I'm not just saying every now and then. For, for since the very beginning to see how the devil, he hates me. And then he turns people against you. He'll turn people against you for no real turn. Don't like him. Don't like him. Because, and then he'll make up a lie to get people to leave the church or to not like me or get away from him. And I laugh because I know, I know exactly what's going on. This, isn't, this is a familiar. This is what I, I understand this level of battle. New levels, new devils, y'all. And so understand that. But it's amazing how sometimes that in moments, I remember a couple weeks ago, I was having one of those about three days where the devil was trying to mess with me. And I can just remember the devil telling the devil. And I just, I smile. I said, you can't win, though. You're not going to win. You're not going to win. You can't win. You can't, you don't have my will. God has my will. Can I have an amen? God has my will. You don't have my will. God has my will. You can't win. You can't win. And then after a while, God's been, it's over. It's over. He, you good. Then I said, whew, well, praise the Lord. I passed the test. All right. But the point is, at some point in time, it's got to come out of your mouth. The devil's not going to get me to get back to drugs again. It's not going to happen. The devil's a lie. The devil's not going to get me to do X, Y, Z. He's not going to be able to do God is going to give me the strength. And then when you start talking, not only just to yourself, but then you start letting the devil know you're not going to win because of God. You have to declare it. You have to prophesy. You have to put that out in the atmosphere, and God responds to that. This is what David did. And then once he... Dismissed his doubters. He had a memorial in, in his mind and, and remembered those things that God had did and released his faith and it dispelled his fears. And he used what he had got and what he was tested and proven in his life. And he was willing to declare and prophesy what was going to happen to his adversary. Then he takes the shot. Then he steps out. And he takes the shot. Look at verse 49. Then David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone. And he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead. And he fell on his face, it says, to the earth. He took a stone. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is a rock of, a fo- of, of offense and a stone of stumbling. We've been talking about foundation. You can't build unless you have the strong, firm foundation in a rock or a stone that you're anchoring everything to. And we have to understand that when it comes to taking your shot, when it comes to taking your shot, and I want everybody to realize, when you're taking a shot and you're doing something for the glory of God, always keep in, keep in mind like David did. That it is not by might nor by power, but it is by God's spirit that you're able to accomplish the task. And Christ is the one who helps you to conquer every vice, every ad- 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 all adversity, and all adversaries in your life. David was willing to take that shot. And for all of us, we have to see that for us in this day, that shot isn't just, you know... What we're using as a tool is not our own ingenuity and creativity and all those other good things. Everything that we do, it has to be inspired by Christ. It has to be because of Christ. It's going to hit its mark because of Christ. And it has to be something that all of us keep in mind because sometimes when God takes you high, there's a sense of getting puffed up with pride and thinking that it was you that made it happen. David took something outside of himself that he used as a weapon or a tool. The Bible says that we use is not God's word like a hammer that breaks rocks in the people. For us, we have to see that it's not us. The tool that we're using to push back darkness is not just our own strength. It's Christ. The devil's not afraid of you. He's afraid of who's in you. 
David sits back and he throws this rock. And by the divine intervention, this rock, along with David's skill, hits this, hits this giant right in the middle of his head. And all of us have to see that in life, if I'm going to hit my mark, I have to make sure I stay connected to Christ. That Christ is my rock. That Christ is going to hit the mark. That Christ is going to cause me to be successful. That Christ is the one that's going to give me a breakthrough when it looks like I'm not going to get a breakthrough. But Christ is the one. That everything, it is all about Christ. So when you take your shot. Don't think that you're taking your shot and it's just you all alone. It's God that's giving you the grace to do it. It's God that gives you the grace to do it. He takes his stone and he throws, he slung it, hit him right in the forehead. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in David's hand. What is the writer doing here? What is the writer doing? He's making the point that it wasn't just him and it wasn't something great it was just the simplicity of him using the stone and throwing it in the right direction and God's super got upon that which was natural he says therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine took his sword and drew out of the sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it and when the Philistines saw that champion was dead he says they fled you know, it's time for us as a church, but for you as an individual to step out. It's time to step out. And stepping out doesn't mean that you got to change everything in your life. David didn't change everything in his life. He went back to that which was, was familiar and he was tested with. And God took his super and put it upon his natural and caused him to have success. But we have to be willing to take the shot. Taking the shot means, means that in your life, you may, you may um, get the feeling that, man, if I don't hit it, what's going to happen? They're going to laugh at me. But you took the shot. You gave God something to work with. You may feel as you're getting ready to take the shot that, that what if I take the shot and, and, and the devil blocks it? Then the devil blocked it. But did you take the shot? Some people never have success because they're afraid to fail. They never have success because they're so afraid to fail. If you fear failure, you are never going to have success. If you fear, if you fear what you don't know or the unknown, then you never are going to have success. And how can you say as an individual that you have faith in God when you never step out? Now, let me just walk you through something, and we're going to close this out. Abraham, when he finally came to a place where he believed God, he trusted God, the Bible says that he left his family, he went to a city that he had not seen. And he stepped out in faith. When it came time for him to, when God told him that you're going to have a child, initially because of his own insecurities, he didn't believe God. He didn't trust God. And he birthed an Ishmael, not realizing that God had, he had an Isaac for him. And it's important that we realize that if you're going to walk with God, you have to walk by faith. Moses, when God told him that he was to go in and speak to Pharaoh, initially he was, he was concerned because he had a stuttering problem. He didn't know if he can communicate right. And then God said, well, take your brother with you. And then we know when he gets to the Red Sea, he stands there and God tells him to lift his arms. He lifts his arms. And God splits the Red Sea for not only him, but for the nation, he was willing to take that shot to step out to see God do something great. When I'm reading the study in the book of Joshua, we see Joshua. God told the priest to go down into the water. And as they go down into the water, they put their feet in the water. Again, God splits now the Jordan. And the people walk again on dry ground. God's history is, if you step out, I'll meet you on the other side. 
God's not going to push you out. He's not going to drag you out. He's not going to tell you. To, he's not going to make your boss come to you. You're going to have to go in and say, hey, listen, hey, hey, there's a point in your life where you have to be willing to take the shot. And it's important for us to realize that we're sitting around waiting for the government to rescue us. And what I mean by that is this. I, I understand government assistance for a period of time. But at some point in time, you got to look them in the eye and say, I can't depend on y'all for the rest of my life. I'm about to get up and I'm about to go get myself a job and God's going to bless me and God, and I'm going to be making more than y'all working up in here because God is here. At some point in time, you get yourself together and say, I'm going to take a shot. I'm going to take a shot. I'm going to take a shot. And there's a point in all of our lives where we look at God's history through Scripture that you see like David. I got to step out. Somebody got to step out. We got to do this. You know, my whole family, our whole family, alcoholics. I'm stepping out. I'm not going to be no alcoholic. And my kids are not going to be alcoholics. And their kids are not going to be alcoholics. And their kids are not going to be alcoholics. Somebody got to break the curse up in here. Can I have an amen? Somebody got to step out and hit the demon in the eye and say, you're not going to get my family too. Somebody has to step out and say, even though it feels uncomfortable, it's something that I have to do. And let me close by saying this. You watch these athletes. Some people, some people have got to a place in their life where they just don't care. Give me the ball. I'm going to shoot this thing. I might hit the top of the backboard. <laughs> but y'all going to know I'm willing to pull the trigger. And in your life, somebody in your family has to be that one. I'm going to college. Yeah. I'm doing it. Y'all can sit here on the backside of the Midian Desert. But I'm going to college. And somebody has to be willing to do that. You individually, us as a church, we're not going to be leasing for the rest of our lives. We're going to own something. Can I have an amen? And we're going to take the shot. We're going to take the shot. And it's the same thing in your personal life. My prayer is, is that we so inspire each other in this church by stepping out personally that people get around you and it makes them. When I read this about David, it makes me say, if God can do this for him, then God, where's a lion at? I want to see another one of them things. <laughs> can I have an Amen. Take me back over there to the Vallejo Zoo. I got something for that. <laughs> Can I have an amen, y'all? Can I have an amen? Something has to get stirred up in our spirits where we start inspiring one another to take the shot. So next time somebody comes to you in this church and says, I don't know if I can do it, you tell them, hey, take the shot. Can I have an amen? Look at your neighbor and tell him, take the shot. Come on, look at somebody else and tell them to take the shot. Come on, everybody, stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. I was, uh, I, I, I tell you what, we... As a church community, iron sharpens iron. When I was talking to Pastor David yesterday, it hit me right between the eyes. He said, Pastor, this wasn't for me. It was for you. He said, take the shot. And, and I'm not just saying just for our church, but I'm just thinking some other stuff in my life too. It's like, you got to take the shot. Take the shot. I remember when I used to play for the Raiders. And uh, we'd be playing against the Green Bay Packers. And this is back in the 90s, y'all, when they had Reggie White. 
and Reggie White was big. <laughs> he was big and mean. And he was a preacher and everything, but he, he wasn't a preacher on Sundays. <laughs> He's like, we're going to give you the ball. And he would be on the right side. And on the right side is, you know, it's two, four, six, eight over here. And then three, five, seven, nine over there. And they say, we're going to call 98 toss. I said, 98. So there's nine, then it's going over there. Well, that's where Reggie White's at. <laughs> you need to call Audible, dog. You need, Rich Gannon, you need to call Audible. But I can remember in my mind growing up just, and then situations like that where after a while, it just it get me fired up to say, okay, they're going to throw the ball over there. I can't, I'm going to do it. I can't wait to do it. I'm going to run that brother over. I'm going to hit that brother, man. I can just remember going through the transformation in my life and, in, you know, and in the pros and everything else where I started to love that opportunity that took strength and courage. And it doesn't mean that I didn't feel, oh, that's Reggie White. But it's like, I'm about to handle this brother right now. Call that play. I can remember going through that transformation. All of us in our lives have to do that. We have a brother in the church, Brother Andre Ward who obviously is a professional, he, he was a professional boxer. And I can remember the first time that he fought um, uh, Kovalev. And then Kovalev hit Dre, and he knocked Dre down. And then I, 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 uh, I saw it, and I was like, wow, because I'd never seen that happen before. But then I seen Dre get up. And then he started whooping that boy so bad. That boy still hasn't recovered. He still hasn't recovered. Dre beat him down. I was like, he laid hands on that brother and won the fight. But then what happened was, I can remember, I can remember Dre called me. And he said, well, you know, they want me to fight him again. I said, and in my mind, I'm thinking, well, I don't know if you should do that. But Dre said, no, I'm going to fight him again. And he started, he started preaching to me. No, I'm going to get that brother. I'm going to get the, He knocked me down. I'm going to get that brother. Watch what happens. And, and I started, I was thinking, and it got me fired up. And then after a while, I was like, yeah, let's get that brother. Let's get that brother. Let's, let's get that brother. Brother, you're from the well, brother. We're going up in there. Get that brother. We're not playing around with this brother. He got me fired up. <laughs> I'm like, Dre went in there and he knocked the guy out. He did it. And, and so stuff like that, I look and I just say, at some point in time, you got to step out. Don't step away. Step to the plate. <laughs> step to the plate in life. And when you step out, God will make meet you on the other side. He did it for David. He'll do it for you. He did it for David. He'll do it for this church. I'm not worried about nothing. We're going to raise that money. We're going to buy this. And you know what's going to happen? This is your church. It's going to be in the church's name. And you're going to have a church for generations to come. This is God's business. And God is the one who did it. Can I have an amen? You got to know, I don't care if it's $50 million. God, if God says go, you go. It's nothing for God. It's nothing. We step out and do what we're supposed to do, and God will meet us on the other side, and he'll multiply every seed that we've sown, and he'll do it in your life. Can I have an amen, y'all? Can I have an amen? This morning, some of you in this room, you are letting fear stop you. I want you to come down to this altar right now. We're going to break that off of you because God has something special in store for your life. He wants to do something great in your life, but you got to step out. If you know God's talking to you, come on down to the altar right now. We're going to pray with you. We're going to pray with you. We're going to believe with you. We're going to take your faith and couple it with our faith, and God is going to explode in your life. Can I have an amen, y'all? Can I have an amen, y'all? I, I want you to come. 
with an expectant heart and saying, God, I believe right now that you're going, I'm stepping out in you. Come on, altar workers, find somebody right now.